On the morning of October 2nd, 2003, Monica Carrasco, a 16-year-old beloved daughter and sister, was discovered missing from her aunt and uncle's house near Balmeray, Texas. The only items missing from Monica's room were her beige nightgown and Bible. The rest of her belongings, including her socks and shoes, were left behind. Despite extensive searches, no traces of Monica has ever been found. It's been more than 20 years since Monica vanished, and investigators are still searching for her. Hey everyone, welcome back to Detective Perspective. My name is Derek Lavasser. I'm a licensed private investigator and former police detective. And each week I'll be covering an unsolved case in story format. I'll then give you my perspective on the investigation and provide contact information for the individuals or organizations connected to the case so that if you have any tips, you can contact them directly and maybe you can help solve a case. And if you're someone who's interested in true crime, specifically unsolved cases, and you would like to hear my opinion on those investigations, please consider subscribing, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever platform you use. So we're going to talk about Monica Carrasco tonight. Again, this case is a little older. We're talking about 20 years. Some interesting circumstances surrounding this case. I do have some theories that we're going to go over at the end of the episode, some things that may have been overlooked at the time when this incident occurred. Uh, but before I get into that, I want to bring up something else, and I know your time's valuable, so I won't take too much time on it, but if not here, where, right? So thinking about unsolved cases and 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 shows like Detective Perspective, because there are other shows out there like this, not many, which is why I'm bringing this up. I've been speaking to some network people, some people in the space, and it's becoming very apparent to me, and it has been for many years with true crime, that the more prevalent cases that are, are featured in true crime are cases that are highly salacious, um, have people that are more known, or the stories just are more of a movie and not necessarily a representation of the majority of the cases that are unsolved and that are out there. And, and you see examples of that every week here on this on the show. And it's becoming very clear to me that media outlets and different platforms are choosing to cover those cases, even when they've been covered at nauseum, because they get more clicks, because they get more attention, because more people want to talk about it. There's more engagement. And let's call it for what it is, be more clicks, more engagement leads to more eyes, more viewers, more advertising dollars. And listen, I have nothing against that. We have ads on this show. We have ads on Crime Weekly. I am very uh, transparent about the fact that we make a living doing true crime. Uh, and I'm, I'm fortunate to be in a position where I get to do something that I love and get paid for and be able to provide for my family. But that's part of the reason that I started Detective Perspective. It's a major reason why I started Detective Perspective because I don't want to say I felt guilty but I felt like I had an obligation to give back and to feature the cases that are the foundation of true crime. These unsolved cases that we cover every single week here, the lesser known cases. Yes, they may have been covered by a few podcasts in the past, but in comparison to the John Benet Ramseys and the Casey Anthony's and the Adnan Syed's and uh, all those cases, it's, it's a, it's a drop in the bucket. There is no comparison. I just wanted to reemphasize that to you guys because we are all a family here. We're all in this together, and this could happen to any of us. And it's important that when we're watching or listening to these episodes, we approach it with that perspective. And you ask yourself, what would I do if this was someone that I knew or cared about? Because if that's the approach that you take, you'll be much more invested in the case and the people involved. And what does that lead to? Well, it leads to you sharing it more, talking about it more, engaging with the content more. And whether you're someone who has a small social media following, I don't care if it's one to five people or you're someone who has millions, 
sharing this content with other people is going to allow more individuals to learn about the specific case that we're covering at the time, but also the show itself and what we're trying to do here. And the more engagement and the more success that the show has, it will incentivize more people in the space to cover cases like this. And that's the ultimate goal, to get everyone involved because there's a lot of these cases. There's no way I can cover them all. And even with the people that are doing it in this, in this space, there's not enough. We need more. Um, but to get even bigger platforms to cover unsolved cases, that is the goal. Because if we can all take on a few, we can really make a dent in the amount of cases that are unsolved out there. Think about it. More than 50% of the homicides in this country go unsolved. So there, And that's not including, that's just homicides. That's not including missing persons cases. So there's a lot we can do. And that was really driven home this week for two reasons. The conversation that I told you I had, but also last week's episode about Rachel, it did extremely well. And there could be other variables that are playing into that. But I think the main one was that it was being shared by a lot of people. Rachel has a lot of supporters in her group, specifically her parents. It was shared on their Facebook page, which has a good following. And I noticed a spike in the viewership, which is great because there was a lot of people who are coming and watching not only her episode, but other episodes that featured different victims and different families. And that makes me extremely happy to know that there's new eyes and new ears on those cases and they're going to spread the message. And we just never know what the outcome is going to be. Uh, all we need is one. We just need to solve one. And once we do that, we move on to the next one. So that's my little spiel. I just wanted to point that out to you guys. I have thoughts throughout the week uh, when I think about what I'm creating, what cases we're choosing, how we're covering them, what we can do to get more people involved. And the the reality of the situation is it comes down to you. Whether you're listening or watching right now, yes, I am. I am talking to you. You have an impact on these cases, whether it's direct knowledge about what happened or your decision to share what you've learned with others. You can make a real difference for these victims and their families. And I hope that's not lost on you. I'm not saying it. Just to give you that rah-rah speech, it's it's a reality. And it's amazing what what a community can do when they come together. I think that's what the true crime community really represents. A group of people working together to try to get the answers that these families deserve. So that's all I had. Thank you for listening. Let's dive into this week's case. Monica Cassandra Carrasco was born on December 13th, 1986 in West Texas, to her parents, Kathy and Ramon. She grew up near Balmeray, a tiny town about 500 people, located roughly two hours from the Mexico border. Kathy remembers Monica as a happy child, always wearing a smile that showed off her cute dimples. Along with her sunny outlook on life, Monica was known for her kindness and willingness to help others. As a teen, Monica loved school, especially science, which was her favorite subject. She dreamed of attending an Ivy League school like Harvard and becoming a lawyer or working at NASA. Outside of school, Monica was active in church, often volunteering to read from the Bible for the whole congregation. When she wasn't at school or church, Monica enjoyed oil painting, playing her alto saxophone, and going for a jog. Unfortunately, tragedy struck Monica's family when she was just 13 years old. On November 8, 2000, her father, who was battling bone cancer, suffered a heart attack right in front of Monica. Family members rushed to perform CPR while they waited 20 minutes for paramedics to arrive, but it was too late. Monica's brother Juan later told Yor Basin that the whole situation was extremely traumatizing for Monica. He said, quote, For anybody who's actually seen CPR being given correctly, it's pretty traumatic, bones breaking and that type of stuff. So all the while, you know that Monica's right there, watching all of this occurring. Juan believes Monica developed PTSD from witnessing her beloved father's death. And according to Kathy, Monica tried to cope with the loss the best she could, but it was understandably very tough. By early 2003, Monica, who was now 16 years old, was suffering from depression and she didn't want to eat or drink. She became very sick and in September, Kathy had to take her to the hospital, which Monica did not like. The doctors prescribed medication and put Monica on a high-protein diet before sending her home. She was unable to return to school for the time being, and Kathy worried about Monica's eating habits when no one was around. However, Kathy, who worked full-time, couldn't monitor Monica's eating habits around the clock. 
Desperate to find help, Kathy searched for a facility specializing in eating disorders, but that was easier said than done. And in the meantime, the family did the best they could to support Monica and the current circumstances she was experiencing. Now, Monica's aunt and uncle, Velma and Abel Baeza, who lived four miles southwest of Balmoray near Highway 17 and Cross County Road 323, offered to let Monica stay with them. This arrangement was ideal for Monica. She had a close relationship with her aunt and uncle, and Monica admired Velma, who reminded her of her father in many ways. Plus, Velma was a stay-at-home mom, so she could make sure that Monica ate throughout the day. But even after Monica went to stay with Velma and Abel, she continued to struggle with eating and eventually developed hypoglycemia, or very low blood sugar, which causes many symptoms including confusion and anxiety. On October 1st, around two weeks after Monica moved in with Velma and Abel, they took her to see a psychiatrist. According to Your Basin, the psychiatrist told Monica that she wasn't ready to go back to school yet, and this left Monica feeling even more depressed. That evening, Monica had plans to go to Bible study at church, but before going, Kathy stopped by to see Monica and get an update on how her appointment went. Monica told Kathy what the doctor had said, and then she and the entire family got into a circle and prayed together. Before Kathy left, she gave Monica a hug and they exchanged I love yous. That was the last time they would ever see each other. At around 8 p.m., Monica called her brother Juan and they talked for a while, but then she started saying some strange things. He later told your basin, quote, she was like, how come you didn't tell me I was Jesus? I'm like, uh, so who told you you were Jesus? And she ended up telling me the little birdies were telling her that she was Jesus. That was a little bit odd, like maybe she was having some type of psychosis going on. I don't know why. The meds she was taking, they were controversial to be taken by a minor. Now, as far as the medications are concerned, he didn't provide any further details on what she was taking or why they were considered to be controversial. Juan went on to say that he asked Monica a few more questions, and then soon after, she snapped out of whatever was going on and asked if she could come stay with him in Austin. He said no, not until she was better, and the doctor said she was clear. After getting off the phone with Juan, Monica played video games with her cousins for a couple hours. And according to the Odessa American, at around 11 p.m., Monica went to sleep. At approximately 1.30 a.m., Monica's cousins checked on her and saw that she was asleep in bed. She was wearing a beige nightgown and her Bible was by her bedside. This was the last time anyone saw Monica. At around 6 a.m., Velma checked Monica's room, but she wasn't there. Velma didn't think much of it at the time, believing Monica either went for a run or went into the garden to pray. A few hours later, Velma realized that she still hadn't seen Monica, so she decided to go searching for her. She wasn't in the garden, and when Velma checked Monica's room, she realized the only items missing were Monica's beige nightgown and her Bible. She did not have her shoes or socks with her. According to Your Basin, Monica's uncle Abel was a justice of the peace at the time, so he was able to call the police and gather multiple agencies to come and search for Monica immediately. When officers arrived, they noticed that the room she was staying in had a door to the outside, which wasn't locked. Her room was undisturbed, and there was no sign of forced entry. At around 9.30 a.m., Kathy called to check on Monica, and that was when Velma told her that Monica was missing. Kathy called her son Juan, who thought that maybe Monica was trying to get to Austin to see him, so he stayed home just in case Monica showed up, but she never did. Kathy immediately left work and headed straight to the Baeza home. When she arrived, there were police officers, sheriff deputies, and border patrol agents searching for Monica. And the search wasn't easy. The area around the Baeza house was extremely rough terrain with rocks, cactus, and thorns. Canines with the Border Patrol did a sweep of the area, but were unable to pick up any scent of Monica. Officers also searched on horseback and from planes and a helicopter, but there was no sign of her anywhere. Town residents eventually heard what was going on and decided to join the search in cars and on foot. They looked everywhere within a 10-mile radius of the Baeza home, but again, they did not find Monica or any evidence that Monica had even left the house at all. Now, police looked into the idea that maybe Monica had run away with a boy, but she didn't have a boyfriend and no local boys were reported missing at that time. Again, remember, this is a very small community. If someone went 
missing, a boy just suddenly disappeared, someone in that community would know about it. And according to the Charlie Project, the police also looked into a bus driver who allegedly harassed Monica five months earlier in May of 2003. Monica did not report this incident to the police, but she was so shaken up by what had happened, she refused to take the bus after this incident. Now, it's important to note that the bus driver was located and interviewed and was ruled out as a suspect in her disappearance. So with the possibility that she had run away with another person looking less and less likely and the bus driver being ruled out, the investigation continued. Eat stress-free this spring with Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals. Every fresh, never-frozen meal is chef-crafted, dietitian-approved, and ready to eat in just two minutes. Choose from a weekly menu of 35 options, including popular options like Calorie Smart, Keto, Protein Plus, and Vegan and Veggie. Also discover more than 60 add-ons every week, like breakfast, on-the-go lunch, snacks, and beverages to help you stay fueled and feel good all day long. So what are you waiting for? Get your chef-prepared meals on the table in two minutes with Factors Ready to Eat Meals so you can get back to doing what you love this spring. And if you're someone who enjoys the finer things in life and you're looking for a gourmet meal, try meals that feature premium ingredients like filet mignon, shrimp, truffle butter, broccolini, and asparagus. And yes, the meals taste just as good as they sound. And remember, Factor Meals eliminate the hassle of prepping, cooking, and cleaning up. So you simply heat it up and enjoy a great meal. And one of the best things about Factor, besides the taste of the food, is the customization. You can customize your weekly meals with the flexibility to get as much or as little as you need, and you can pause or reschedule deliveries that suit your lifestyle. Listen, I've talked to you guys about Factor a lot. I love them. I live by them. And the meals are great. I've also talked about the add-ons. I have the bacon and cheddar egg bites probably two three times a week. Uh, it, it's, they're my go-to. You don't have to substitute efficiency for taste. And that's what I love about factors because a lot of the times when you're going with these quick hit meals, they, they don't taste as good or they all taste the same. That is not the case with factor. And in addition to everything I just mentioned, factor is celebrating earth day all month long. So make sure to look out for the earth month eats badge on their menu for the lowest carbon footprint meals. So what are you waiting for? Get started this spring and head over to factormeals.com slash detective 50 and use my code DETECTIVE50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box. That's code DETECTIVE50 at factormeals.com slash DETECTIVE50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box while your subscription is active. I want to thank Factor for sponsoring this week's episode. Let's get back to the case. On October 3rd, the day after Monica went missing, Velma told the Odessa American that the anniversary of Monica's father's passing was coming up on November 8th. She believed that might have been a factor in Monica's disappearance. And she went on to say, quote, she was in a deep depression. She was never on a high, very confused and sad. The following day, one of Monica's uncles, Rosendo, told the Odessa American that the police had followed a few leads, but they went nowhere. All they knew so far was that Monica was nowhere around Balmeray. The town was too small for her to hide in. Rosendo suggested that Monica might have been picked up by a driver on Highway 17, which was about four blocks from Velma and Abel's house. The highway heads towards Mexico, which added to the worry about Monica's whereabouts. Rosendo said, quote, I believe she walked out on that highway and somebody just picked her up. What else could it be? He did mention that there was one positive thing about this potential theory. If someone who wasn't a criminal gave her a ride, she was probably still alive. The Reeves County Sheriff also spoke to the Odessa American, stating that officers hadn't given up on their search, however, they didn't have a theory as to what might have happened to Monica. The Sheriff said, quote, We didn't find any hard clues where we could say, yeah, that's what happened. Right now we're just hoping she'll pop up somewhere. He also mentioned that Rosendo's theory about Monica going to Highway 17 was still a real possibility. For weeks, the search for Monica continued. A nationwide alert was released and posters offering a $2,000 reward were distributed. By October 18th, the police had scoured all locations. They had dragged Lake Balmeray and drained all irrigation ditches leading to the lake. They looked in caves, on mountains, under bridges, and in culverts, everywhere they could think of, 
but Monica was nowhere to be found. The searches stopped around that time, and there were few updates in the case until April of 2004, when Monica had been missing for six months. At that time, the police asked for volunteers to help them search for Monica again. They conducted another large-scale search with cadaver dogs, but there was no sign of Monica. They also searched again in the summer, but nothing turned up then either. In December, Kathy wrote a blog post about how difficult it was not knowing where her daughter was. She said, quote, Every morning when I wake up, I think she's going to be there. I still have a feeling in my heart she's somewhere and she's okay. But lately, it's been harder. Her 17th birthday was December 13th. I've been in far more despair because she hasn't called me. In April of 2005, the police announced that foul play was suspected in Monica's disappearance. Unfortunately, they didn't provide any additional details. Now, I don't know exactly how law enforcement came to this opinion. It's my guess that it was more of an exclusionary ruling or a case of reasonable deduction. What do I mean by that? Well, they probably explored the scenarios, or I shouldn't say probably, they definitely explored the scenarios that this was voluntary, that maybe Monica had had walked off and committed suicide or that she had left voluntarily with someone else, or that she had ran away, or that she was attempting to get to her brother, something. And there's no evidence of that. There's no evidence of her leaving the house. There's no evidence of her getting to the highway. There's no evidence of her packing belongings for some type of trip. Everything was left behind. And so with that all ruled out, and with the amount of exposure this case has had, the fact that they haven't had any reported sightings of her anywhere or that she hasn't tried to reach out to her family members, Kathy, anybody, Velma, Abel, her cousins, her brother, no one. They're left to believe that whatever happened to her and whatever the current state is, she's unable to communicate with anyone. You can take that how you want it. Is she being held somewhere? Is she, is she no longer with us? Both options are viable. And the fact that no one has come forward with any information leads people to believe, especially in law enforcement, that someone is responsible for this or a group of people are responsible for this. And they're deliberately not coming forward because it would implicate them in a crime. And I think that's where they're coming up with, the, with this conclusion that whatever happened to Monica was criminal in nature. Now, there were a few updates after April 2005 and throughout the years, Monica's family and the police partnered with various organizations and TV shows to bring attention to Monica's disappearance, including America's Most Wanted and Nancy Grace, America's Missing. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children also released an age-progressed photo of what Monica might look like at 19 years old. And because of all this exposure, by January of 2011, the police had received thousands of tips, but none of them led to Monica. Kathy spoke to the media and said, quote, I tell people it's like a nightmare. It's like a bad, bad dream and you can't wake up. I always try to think positive and hope that she's well. I feel that she's somewhere, that she's alive and well, and I feel like she wants to come home, but for some reason she can't. That's how I feel. In 2014, Monica had been missing for 11 years so the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children released another age progress photo of what Monica might look like at 27 years old. Then in March of 2015, the Reeves County Sheriff's Office announced that they were reinvigorating the investigation into Monica's disappearance. The sheriff told CBS7, quote, she just disappeared and nobody knows if someone picked her up. There's a lot of speculation that she probably went off with somebody. However, the sheriff said that speculation was not good enough for Reeves County. He stated it was time to figure out what happened to Monica so they could close the case and provide answers to her family. He said, quote, we've got to find closure for the family and we've got to find closure as well. We've got to find out what really happened to her, if she ran away or if something happened. So I wanna talk about what the sheriff said there because you know, considering the title of the show, I don't think I do it enough. I'm always focused on the investigatory process and putting the puzzle pieces together, but I don't talk about the mental toll that these cases can have on the investigators working them. Like he said, we want to give closure to the family, but we need closure as well. It's really difficult, especially in a small community 
where you have this lack of resolution, this lack of answers, and you as a human being, being in the capacity you're in as a, an investigator, you're responsible for finding those answers. And when you don't, it's not like something you just put back on a shelf and you forget about it. It stays with you. And many of these investigators are husbands, their wives, their sisters, their brothers, their fathers, their mothers. So as much as you try to stay impartial, you do relate to the people that you're working for and the victim that you're trying to find. So I'm sure a lot of these officers were looking at Monica and, and thinking about her and thinking about what if it was their daughter or, or their niece or their nephew and, and really wanting to find out what happened to her, not only for the community, but also for themselves. So when that doesn't happen, it can have a severe mental toll on the person who's responsible for solving that case. And there are many officers that talk about mental health and the effects that these cases can have on them, even when they do solve them. And so I was happy to see the transparency of the sheriff there where he he's he's being open with the public saying, hey, listen, yes, we're doing this for ultimately for Monica and, and yes, for her family, but we're also doing this because we need this as well. Now, as far as reopening the case, it's been a few years. This is what needs to happen. This is what we always talk about. It might be the same agency working the case, but now you have new officers, new sheriffs, a fresh set of eyes, new perspectives, someone who can go in there, look at the case file for the first time, and maybe see something that was missed by the original investigators or based on new science and technology that's available at the time, look at the case and say, hey, we can do this type of method here, or we can deploy this type of technology here, and we couldn't do that when this originally occurred. So it's important to, you know, every five to 10 years to take that case back off the shelf and say, hey, what can we do now based on the tools we have available? So again, hats off all around on the decision to do this. This is the right move. Now, in order to solve this case, the sheriff and his deputies were starting from the beginning of the case and re-interviewing everyone. And at that time, they didn't have a target of the investigation. Everyone was a potential suspect. Now, since the investigation was reignited by the sheriff, there have not been many updates in the case. And in 2019, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children again released another age progress photo of what Monica might look like at 33 years old. Now, in my opinion, this case took an interesting turn in November of 2021 when Kathy and Juan spoke to Your Basin. They shared that when Monica first went missing, there was a big effort to find her, but they don't believe that Monica's aunt and uncle's home was thoroughly searched or preserved. The police believed that she had just wandered off, so they didn't treat the house as a potential crime scene. This left Kathy and Juan wondering if anything important was missed. Now, to make matters worse, because Abel was a justice of the peace and knew the area around the house, he was allowed to lead a lot of the searches. But according to Kathy and Juan, that probably wasn't a good thing because Abel was later considered a potential suspect and was questioned by the police for his possible involvement in Monica's disappearance. Now, unfortunately, Juan and Kathy didn't provide any further details on why Abel was considered a suspect. And according to the Charlie Project, he did fail a polygraph, but as we know, polygraphs aren't always reliable, but should still be considered. Now, this part was a little confusing, but during the same interview, the reporter asked Kathy if she thought that Abel was involved in Monica's disappearance, and Kathy said she had a hard time believing that a family member could be involved. It didn't cross her mind at the beginning, and even now that Abel has passed away, she still didn't feel that he could have done anything. So you see what I'm saying there? In one breath, it sounds like they're suggesting that if the house had been searched more thoroughly or had been treated as a crime scene, it may have implicated someone in the home. But, you know, two seconds later, she's saying, listen, I didn't consider Abel a suspect at the time. And even now, I still don't consider him a suspect. I don't think he did anything. Why is she doing that? Is, be is that because she doesn't have any information to suggest he does or is it a respect thing because he's he's deceased i can't get into the mind of kathy but i do find it interesting that she is giving a little bit of an insight into what she thinks about and the potential what ifs 
and at the same time still being respectful for the people that are no longer here and not wanting to accuse someone of something that they had nothing to do with. Now, unfortunately, there have been no further updates in Monica's case, and her family remains desperate for answers. Kathy said that she continues to hold on to hope that Monica is alive. She prays that she's still out there somewhere and that she's okay. And she asked for anybody with information to come forward so that no matter what the circumstances, the family can at least find some peace. All right, let's dive into this perspective, and it's going to be pretty clear cut. I think there's two viable scenarios here. I know I always say there's you can go a, a ton of different ways with this. I just don't think based on what we know that the evidence points to one of the other scenarios that you could potentially think about. I don't think she committed suicide. I know she wasn't in the best place at that time, but even that night she was asking Juan that, you know, can I come live with you in Austin? So we know that she wasn't completely happy where she was staying, but she wasn't looking for a way out in the sense of I'm just going to end my life. It was more so like, where can I go from here? So I think she was more looking in that direction as opposed to, to killing herself. And I think we're down to basically two scenarios because of that reasoning. We're talking about a five hour window here. She was last seen at 1.30 a.m. when allegedly her cousins came into the bedroom and she was asleep. And then at 6 a.m. when Velma walked in, she was gone. So very small window there. Here's the problem. And we have to start off our perspective with this. We're basing our investigation off the accounts of the last people to see her alive. I'm not trying to be disrespectful here. I'm trying to be practical. I'm trying to be objective. And whenever someone just drops off the face of the earth, you have to look at the last people she was with and their credibility. And to Kathy's point, if everyone goes into this case looking outside the house, right, looking out to where she could have gone, then they're missing what could be in the house to suggest where she's been. And what I mean by that is if something happened to her in that home that could have led to her death or disappearance, it's very likely that it could have been overlooked because, again, everyone was, quote, unquote, on the same team. You had Abel leading the searches, Velma out there speaking about how Monica was not in the right state of mind and that she was just always upset and, and never happy the next day, suggesting that she might have ran off because she was unhappy. So you have a, the two main people, the two adults in that home, basically controlling the narrative to a certain degree. And because it's a small community, and I'm sure because a lot of people knew Abel and knew Velma, probably took them at their word. Now, I'm not saying they weren't telling the truth. I'm just putting out to you that when we're basing our investigation off a foundation that was essentially facilitated and built by the last people with her, you always have to approach that with a certain level of skepticism. So what we're going to do tonight is start before those accounts. We know that Monica was there. We know that she talked to Juan. What happened after she asked Juan to go live with him and he said no? We don't know. We don't know for certain. It's alleged that she was playing video games. It's alleged that she was in bed sleeping. No one knows that for certain. The people in that home are family members, and we think they have good intention, but if something had happened, it is possible that they all stuck to the same story, as you would expect from the family members. So there's a lot that could have happened in that house that led to an injury or an assault. Maybe she left with someone from that home and just never returned. Again, these are all things we have to consider, and I found it very interesting as I was initially reading this story. I was thinking about this scenario, and then later in life, Kathy kind of gave some 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 truth to it as well, or at least an avenue for it where I'm not the only one who's thought about that. And I'm sure, listen, this isn't some revelation. I'm sure many of you, as you're listening or watching this episode, it's running through your head as well. And that could explain why we don't have answers, right? If the evidence as to what happened to Monica were in that house, they were long gone before law enforcement got there or law enforcement left and they were, and th that evidence was wiped out after the fact. So that is one potential scenario. 
that Monica never left that house under her own power. She could have already been deceased or incapacitated or left with someone who was living in that house. And while they were out, something transpired and she just never came home. One other scenario, and I know I'm going really far off here, and this is without knowing Abel's background or Velma's background or the cousin's background for that matter. You know, trafficking, human trafficking is a big thing along the border. She's a young girl. She's in a bad mental state. Is it possible that Monica was turned over to some type of human trafficking organization, a gang, uh, in exchange for funds, in exchange for money? I really hope that's not the case, not only for Monica, but also that this would involve the family. For all accounts, I hope it's not the case, but it's definitely something you have to consider. And if it were the case, it wouldn't be the first time something like this has happened. Now, before I go forward, I do want to qualify out of respect for the family and for the sake of being litigious that I have no evidence to suggest that this is what happened. I only put this scenario out there because based on the lack of evidence, I do agree with authorities that this more than likely is a result of foul play. So someone's involved. And the first scenario is the one that I just laid out to you that one of the family members that were living with her is somehow responsible for her death or disappearance. And the other scenario is the one we're going to talk about right now. So let's say for the sake of this conversation that the family's not involved. We know that Monica was in a bad place and she was unhappy where she was staying. She said that to Juan. She wanted to move with him in Austin. He said, no, I'm sure that didn't make her happy. After that conversation, is there a possibility that she decided, hey, he's not going to let me move with him. I'm better off on my own. When everyone goes to sleep tonight, I'm leaving. And I'm going to leave no trace of where I went so no one can ever find me. She could have been playing video games with the cousins. And then when they came in around 1, 1 1.30, she looked like she was sleeping. And as soon as they walked out of the room, she grabs maybe a T-shirt and a pair of shorts that the family, you know, didn't account for. Maybe a pair of sandals or, or some slip-on, something that she can at least walk in. And then she proceeds to head toward Highway 17 to hitchhike, to pick up a ride. And... She probably is picked up by someone, young girl near the border. If that's the case, I hope for Kathy's sake as well that, yeah, she is over on the Mexican side of the border and she's okay and she's living a better life, but the, the likelihood is not high. If someone picked her up and she has not reached out to Kathy since 20 years to at least say, I'm okay, I'm fine. That is highly suggestive that whatever happened to Monica that night or in the weeks that followed, it was not a positive outcome. She may have encountered someone who presented themselves as a friend when really they were a foe. And if that is the case, the likelihood of us finding Monica at this point is not high, but it's not impossible. And there could be a situation where someone who was involved sees something and has a conscience at this point and decides to finally come forward and at least out of the respect for Kathy and for the sake of her well-being so she can move on with her life and at least knowing what happened, maybe give an anonymous tip, maybe call the sheriff's office just to say, hey, this is what went down. You're never going to be able to confirm it, but this is this is what happened to Monica and this is why you haven't found her yet. That's my hope, that someone decides to anonymously come forward who may have been involved during that whole incident and give the family the answers that they, they're desperately seeking and they deserve. But I do have to tell you, if you're making me choose, I think the first scenario is the more likely scenario. You have to remember, and I just said it two minutes ago, her room, the only thing missing according to the family was her brown or beige nightgown and the Bible. That's it. No footwear, no clothing. Uh, we talked about how rough the terrain was. If Monica left there under her own power because of her own choice, I think she would have grabbed a pair of shoes and some socks and or, or a pair of slides or sandals, something to protect her feet uh, so that she's not walking over rock and cactus and thorns. So the fact that she didn't take anything I don't know if she she walked out of that place. 
she may have been carried. And then the question becomes, what was her condition when she was carried? And I'll leave that up to you guys to decide. And as far as you guys are concerned, and as far as closing this case, it's going to take someone coming forward with new information that can help law enforcement figure out what happened and identify any potential suspects. So let's give a quick recap of this case. At the time of her disappearance, Monica was five foot five with brown eyes and black hair, possibly with red streaks. She is Hispanic with a medium complexion. She has pierced ears, a chicken pox scar on her forehead near her hairline, a small light colored mole on her left cheek and dimples on both cheeks. So if you have information in Monica's disappearance, you can call the Crime Stoppers hotline at 1-800-252-8477. And remember, there is a reward available. I want to send my thoughts out to Monica's family, especially Kathy, Juan. And also, I want to send my my, my thoughts to Velma and, and Abel, who are, who's no longer with us. Um, because at this point, we don't know what happened. And they could be victims as well. So I'm thinking of the entire family. I know it's been a very long time, but I'm sure hearing this information even now is never easy. So we're thinking of them and we're fighting for them and we're hoping that there's a break in this case that leads to some answers. I wanna thank you guys for being with me. Everyone stay safe out there and I'll see you next week.